everyone. Welcome to an ASMR reading from the Standard Horse and Stock book. Today I'm going to read to you about bees. Bees, their place in history. The bee, says the Encyclopedia Britannica, from its singular instincts, its active industry, and the useful products resulting from its labors, has, from the remotest times, attracted general attention and interest. No nation upon earth has had so many historians as this remarkable class of insects. The patience and sagacity of the naturalist have had an ample field for exercise in the study of the structure, physiology, and domestic economy of bees. Their per preservation and increase have been objects of assiduous care to the agriculturalist. Excuse me, I will try to pronounce better, but sometimes it's hard. Let's just enjoy the experience. And their reputed perfection of policy and government have long been the theme of admiration and have supplied copious materials for argument an allusion to the poet and the moralist in every age. It is a subject that has been celebrated by the muse of Virgil and illustrated by the philosophic gen genius of Aristotle. Cicero and Pliny record that Aristocamus devoted 60 years to the study of these insects, and Philisius Philiscus is said to have retired to a remote wood that he might pursue his observations on them without interruption. A very great number of authors have written expressed treaties on bees. Periodical works have been published relating, to, relating exclusively to their management and economy. And learned societies have been established for the sole purpose of conducting researches on this subject. Multum in parvo. How could this be otherwise? Within this little body are contained apparatus for converting various sweets which it collects into one kind of nourishment for itself, another for the common brood, a third for the royal brood, glue for its carpentry, wax for its cells, poison for its enemies, honey for its master, and the proboscis as long as the body itself. Microscopic in several parts, telescopic in its mode of action, with a sting so, in, so exceedingly sharp that, it, that were it magnified by the same glass which makes a needle's point seem a quarter of an inch, it would yet itself be invisible and this too a hollow tube. And all these varied operations and contrivances are included within a half an inch in length and two grains weight of matter. A wonderful community. Professor Jager says, it is impossible for any reflecting person to look at a beehive in full operation without being astonished at the activity and surprising industry of its inhabitants. We see crowds constantly arriving from the, from the woods, meadows, fields, and gardens, laden with provisions and materials for future use, while others are continually flying off on similar collecting expeditions. Some are carrying out the dead, others are removing dirt and offal, while others are giving battle to any strangers that may dare intrude. Suddenly a cloud appears and the bees hurry home, thronging at the entrance to the hive by thousands, till all are gradually received within their enclosure. In the interior of the hive we see with what skill they work their combs and deposit the honey. And when their labor is over for the day, they rest in chains suspended from the ceiling of their habitation, one bee clinging with its forefeet to the hind feet of the one above it, until it seems impossible 
the upper, that the upper one can be strong enough to support the weight of so many hundreds. The three classes. The leading feature in the natural history of bees and one which distinguishes them from almost all other insects is their singular distribution into three different classes, constituting to all appearances so many different modifications of sex. In the cuts, the size is enlarged beyond that of nature, but the proportions are preserved. The drone, the male of the species, has a thicker body around her head, a more flattened shape, and more obtusely terminated abdomen. It has no sting and may be detected by the humming noise that accompanies its flight. The queen bee, the female, is the largest of three and has a longer abdomen with two ov ovaria of considerable size and a curved sting. The workers compose the third class and are distinguished by the smallness of their size, their length of proboscis, the peculiar structure of their legs and thighs adapted to the collection of certain materials obtained from vegetables and by the apparent absence of any generative organs. It is their function to prefer to perform all the laborious offices for the community, to construct the interior of their habitation, to explore the country in search of nourishment and other materials, to collect and bring them to the hive and apply them to different purposes, to attend upon the queen and supply all her wants, to defend the hive from the attacks of the, uh, the predators, and to carry on hostilities against the various enemies of the tribe. A unique division. Here, then, is a wide departure from the methods by which other animals live and are perpetuated. The keeping up of the race is confined by nature to members of the community other than those who do the, its actual work. This arrangement, we believe, is a unique one. Instead of the power of perpetration being committed to the rank and file, and the rank of file divided into male and female in approximately equal proportions, the sexual functions being performed by individuals who have to take care of themselves otherwise, here we find a most curious division of labor. Whereas in other departments of animated nature, the male holds the post of honor and rules by virtue of his virility, here he is merely tolerated because his services are indispensable and when the use of them has passed, he is ingloriously hustled out of the, of the existence, a necessary existence. The female, the mother of all in the same hive, and will endure no sister. Her labors are constant and her life long. The overwhelming majority are sexless, mere workers, to whom all paternity and maternity are as foreign as the sympathy of Beethoven's to a born, man born deaf. The honeybee and its varieties. The best known varieties of honeybee are the German or black bee and, li and the Ligurian or Italian bee. The so-called black bees are really a grayish black. The German bees are about of one color. The Italians are easily distinguished by the right, bright yellow rings when the breed is pure at the base of the abdomen. The Egyptian bees have a broad band of yellow and are smaller and more slender than the Italian bees. The Cyprian bee is yellow and is doubtless a variety of the Italian. Many other fancy varieties are yearly advertised but it's best to thick with the well-tried German and Italian bees. The drones, their shape and number. The males are called drones for the peculiar noise they make in their flight and are much larger than the workers and thicker in proportion. Their antennae have an additional joint and their eyes are remarkably large, meeting upon the crown. 
They produce neither wax nor honey, and live by the labor of others, of which they are mere idle spectators. The intercourse with the queen, for which alone they seem to exist, takes place in the open air and on the wing. The queen, carrying back with her to the hive, part of the mutilated body of the drone she has met, and he falling to the ground to per perish. Although this occurs to a queen once in her lifetime, still, as it must be in the open air, Hewer thinks the otherwise apparently unnecessary number of drones is needed, that she may be sure to encounter one when she flies abroad for the purpose. In the spring, they are said to be 30th to 40th of the whole. A fedundated queen seems to lay drone or workers' eggs at will. An unfedundated queen lays eggs indiscriminately in drones and worker cells, but her eggs produce drones only. Massacre of the Drones After swarming time, when the queens are impregnated, and no new swarms are about to take place. The workers, who have then allowed the drones to live unmolested in, in the hive, are all of a sudden seized with a deadly fury towards them. This usually happens in June, July, or August. They chase their unhappy victims in every quarter until they drive them to the bottom of the hive, where they indiscriminately massacre them and throw them on the ground. Not only do they kill every living drone, but they destroy all male eggs and larvae and tear open the cocoons of their pupae. This sacrifice of the drones is not an undiscriminating instinct, for if a hive be deprived of the, its queen, the massacre does not take place in that particular hive, and the drones are allowed to survive the winter. Their normal age unknown. Drones seldom die a natural death. From the egg to the full grown male, about 25 days are needed. There is no evidence of the duration of the lives of individuals, but in usual course, they are hatched about May and slaughtered in June, July, or August. The Queen Bee, her appearance. She is considerably longer than either the workers or the males, distinguished by the yellow tint of the under part of the body and by the shortness of her wings, which instead of reaching to the extremity of the abdomen, leave some of its rings uncovered. There is commonly only one perfect queen existing at one time within one hive, and she usually appears to be treated by all the other bees with every mark of affection and deference. Her metamorphosis. When from the egg or young larva, it is the intention of the bees to raise a queen. Their attention is most incessantly bestowed upon it. Its cell is enlarged and it is supplied with a particular and more stimulating food than that of ordinary bees not mawkish, but acid, and in quantities larger than can be consumed, so that some always remains over after the transformation. The growth and development of the larva are thus accelerated, and in five days it is prepared to spin its web when the workers wall it up. After two days and a half, a larva becomes a pupa. In this state, it remains four or five days and on the sixteenth day, after the laying of the egg, the perfect insect is produced, and it is liberate, liberated by the workers. Laying her eggs. The queen deposits eggs during ten or eleven months of the year in temperate climates. If the impregnation of the queen be delayed beyond the twenty-first day of her life, she becomes incapable of impregnation and can only produce drone eggs. The abdomen of such a queen is much more slender than that of a fertile one. Young queens ordinarily commence 
oviposting or egg laying 36 hours after impregnation. How the queen determines the sex of her eggs is not known, but eggs that will produce workers or queens will always be found in worker cells and those that will produce drones in drone cells. A queen of a new swarm will, rare, will rarely produce drones the first year. Instinct seemingly teaching her that they will not be required. In the early spring, a piece of empty drone comb be put into the center of the brood, brood nest. The queen will usually fill it with drone eggs. Number of legs, uh, excuse me, number of eggs laid. It is the queen's business to keep the colony populous and certainly she attends to her business. She is capable of laying two to three thousand eggs a day and has been known to lay six eggs in a minute. Burrell Patch tells of a queen that laid 3,021 eggs in 24 hours by actual count and 57,000 eggs in 20 days. That she continued prolific for five years and must have laid during that time 1,300,000 eggs. Other careful observers also say that a queen may lay more than 1 million eggs. Her spermatheca is capable, according to Leckhart, of containing 25 million spermatosa. It can be compressed at will, as is probable. There may be a hint of the way in which she produces the two different classes of eggs. Loss of the Queen This event has a most marked influence on the workers, although it is nearly an hour before her absence seems to be discovered. Inquietude begins in one part of the hive. The workers become restless, abandon the young they were feeding, running to and fro, and communicate the alarming intelligence to their companions. The whole community is soon in a ferment. The bees rust percepti perceptibly from the hive and seek in every direction for the lost queen. After a day or two, tranquility is reestablished and they reset to their labors. Select an egg or larva and rear a new queen as already described. Rivalship of the queens. A queen bee though perfectly formed, is not at liberty to come out of her cell, which becomes a prison if the queen mother be still in the hive, waiting to lead out another swarm. The workers even strengthen the covering of the queen's cell, perforating it with a small hole through which the captive can thrust her tongue out her tongue to be fed. The royal prisoner keeps up a plaintive cry, called by beekeepers, piping, and this is answered by the mother queen. The modulations of this piping are said to vary. The motive of this proceeding on the part of the workers is to be found in the implacable hatred which the old queen bears against all of her own sex, which impels her to destroy without merit, without mercy, all the young queens she can reach. So when there is a prospect of a swarm soon issuing, they establish themselves as a guard around the queen's cells, and, forgetting their usual allegiance, beat off the old queen as she tries to approach them. But if the swarming season is over, the bees do not hinder the old queen, who immediately transfixes her sting, one after another, of the royal brood. According to Huber, royal larvae construct only imperfect cocoons, open behind, leaving exposed the abdomen below the first ring, as if nature intended to give the old queen a chance at them with her fatal sting. Queen Combats The same writer has made the singular observation that two queens, however, inter uh, inverterate their mutual hostility never actually destroy each other. When in combat, and in contest, 
they come into a, into such a relative position they, that they that each can sting the other mortally. They suddenly separate and and part as if panic stricken. Without this instinct, a hive might altogether deprive be altogether deprived of a queen. Alien queens. Bees recognize the, the person of their own queen. If a stranger enters the hive, they seize and surround her till a ball of bees is formed one or two inches in diameter, and there keep her until she dies, as they seldom sting the queen. But a hive that has lost its queen can, a certain, can by certain precautions be introduced to accept a substitute. A usual way is to imprison the stranger queen in a small wire gauze cage and suspend, suspend her between two central combs. Soon the bees become accustomed to the odor and appearance of the new sovereign and after a day or two readily accept her. But if a super uh, numerary queen be introduced into the hive, she is seized and brought to the reigning queen. A ring is formed and the bees fight it out till one or the other perishes. Some observers hold that the vanquished queen is killed by the bees, others that the victor kills her. Length of life. The life of a queen bee will sometimes extend to four or five years, where her fertility generally decreases after her second breeding season. When absent from the hive, on a matrimonial excursion, she often falls prey to a bird, and sometimes she makes a mistake and enters another hive where she does not belong, and then she or the original queen is destroyed. But if no accident happens to her, her life will probably last as above stated. The workers, their shape and appearance. They have a body about half an inch in length and about one-sixth of an inch in greatest breadth at the upper part of the ab abdomen. The antenna are twelve jointed and terminate in a knob. The abdomen consists of six joints or rings and under the scaly coverings of the four middle ones are situated the wax pockets or organs for the secretion of wax. The extremity of the abdomen is provided with a sting which is straight. The basal joint of the hind tarsi is dilated to perform a pollen, pollen based basket. And the legs are well provided with hairs for collecting pollen and brushing it into this receptacle. The egg, the larva, and the pupa. The eggs of bees are of a long shape and bluish white color, about one twelfth of an inch in length. They are hatched in about three days. The larvae are little worm-like creatures having no feet and lying coiled up like a ring. They are diligently fed by the workers until in about five days, when large enough to fill the cell, they refuse food, upon which the attendant bees seal up the cell with wax, and the larva spinning itself into a fine silken envelope or cocoon is transformed into a pupa and about the 18th day or so in the case of drones and the 24th day from the deposition of the egg the young bee in its perfect state breaks the covering and issues from the cell it is caressed and supplied with food by the attendant bees and is believed not to try its wings until the following day. The cell from which it has issued is speedily cleaned out and prepared for the reception of another egg or of honey. The fine silken envelope of the pupa, however, remains attached to the cell, of which the, the capacity thus becomes gradually smaller until the cells of old combs are too small to receive eggs and can be used for honey alone. Food of the larva. The food with which the larva are supplied is a mixture of pollen, honey, 
and water, with the addition, possibly, of some secretion from the stomachs of the workers in which it is prepared. It varies a little according to the age and kind of larva and the peculiarities of that which of that given to young queens are indispensable to fit them for their future functions. Pollen is constantly stored, found stored up in the cells of the hive and is often called bee bread. Combs. The combs of a beehive are parallel to each other, forming vertical strata of about an inch in thickness and distant about half an inch from each other. The cells are therefore nearly horizontal, having a slight and somewhat variable dip towards the center of each comb. The central comb is generally first begun and next after it those next to it on each side. Circumstances frequently cause some departure from the uniform and symmetrical plan, which however still remains obvious. Each comb consists of two sets of cells, one on each side, and it may be mentioned as an illustration of the wonderful industry of bees and the results of their combined labors that a piece of comb 14 inches long by 7 inches wide and containing about 4,000 cells has been frequently constructed in, 20, constructed in 24 hours. The greater part of the comb usually consists of the kind of cells fitted for breeding workers, a, a smaller part of it the larger or drone cells. After the, the principal breeding season is over, the cells of some parts of the comb are often elongated for the reception of honey, and sometimes comb of greater thickness or with unusually long cells is constructed for that purpose alone, in which case the mouths of the cells are inclined upwards, more than is usual for the ordinary brood cells. When a cell has been completely filled with honey, its mouth is sealed or covered with wax. Royal cells. These are very different, being vertical and not horizontal in their position, not hexagonal, but rather oval in form, and much larger than the other cells, even in proportion to the size of the animal that is to inhabit them. They are generally placed on the edge of a comb and when they have served their purpose, are partially removed, so that during winter they resemble acorn cups in appearance. Their wonderful construction. The cells are hexagonal or six-sided, the hexagons perfectly regular, and in this way there are no interstices between the cells. There are only three regular figures, that is, figures of which all the sides and angles are equal, bounded by straight lines, with which a space can be perfectly filled up in this way. The equilateral triangle, the square, and the hexagon. And of these, the hexagon is at once the most suitable for the larva of the bee in its form and the strongest in its nearest approach to the circle. The circular form itself would have left large interstices. The partition wall between the two sets of cells is not a simple plane. It is made up of little rooms or four-sided figures with two acute and two obtuse angles made to terminate in three-sided pyramids. The individual cells are not opposite each other, but the point of meeting of three sides of three cells on one side is opposite the wall of a cell on the other side. The only departure from perfect regularity is the form of the cells in the transition from the smaller or worker cells to the larger or drone cells, which is managed 
with an equally great simplicity and beauty of contrivance. The instinct of a bee is equal to problems the mere comprehension of which needs an educated human brain. Wax. The material of which the cells are built is chiefly wax, which is at the first white, but becomes brownish yellow with age, and in very old combs almost black. Each ounce of wax represents about 20 ounces of honey. Beeswax is now known to be produced by a chemistry carried on in the bodies of bees, and they produce wax and build combs when supplied only with honey or saccharine substances. The bees which are about to proceed to wax making suspend themselves in clusters in the hive, attaching themselves to each other by means of hooks with which their feet are provided. And whilst they remain motionless in this position, the wax appears to be formed in small scales, which they afterwards take in their mouths and curiously work up with a secretion from the mouth itself, passing the wax in the form of a minute riband through the mouth, first in one direction and then in the opposite one, and finally depositing it in its proper place for the foundations of the comb. One bee always begins the comb alone. The rest, in gradually increasing numbers, proceed in accordance with what has already been done. The bees which elaborate and deposit the wax do not, however, construct the cells, which is done by others, partly at least by a process of evacuation. Um, excavation in the wax deposited. It is supposed by many naturalists that some of the working bees are exclusively wax workers, some nurses, etc., but others think that there is only one class of working bees, all ready for any kind of work according to circumstances. Propolis. But wax although the chief is not the only material of combs. Propolis is also employed in small bands to give greater strength to the cells, the mouths of which are surrounded with it and made thicker than their walls. This substance, which is obtained by bees from the viscous buds of trees, is also employed for more firmly attaching the combs to the hive for closing up apertures in the hive, for covering up obnoxious substances, intruding slugs, etc., which are too large to be removed, and for a variety of similar purposes. Food of bees. This is of two kinds, the fluid secretions of vegetables contained in the nectar nectaries of flowers, and the dust of the anthers called by botanists the pollen, but which, when collected by bees, has received various names, farina, bee bread, etc. Sometimes they feed on other substances, honeydew, syrup, etc. The organs by which they collect and utilize their food are very complex. The proboscis. This organ of five parts may be considered as a lengthened tongue. It is a prolongation of the underlip and is rolled over the fluid ailment, taking up what adheres to it, which the bee then licks up. Mandibles and teeth. For mechanically dividing solid materials, the mouth is furnished with two strong mandibles or jaws and four palpi or feelers. These are used in eating. The teeth are two in number and have the form of concave scales with sharp edges, are fixed to the end of the jaw and play horizontally. Stomachs. The bee has two. The first 
a large transparent bag pointed in front and swelling out into two pouches behind. Like the crop of birds, it receives and temporarily retains the fluid of the nectaries. No digestion or other change in the food is detected here. From this reservoir, the food or honey may be thrown back into the mouth and deposited in cells or imparted to other bees. For digestion, a second stomach is provided. Collection of pollen the pollen, or fertilizing dust of flowers, is collected by bees for the purpose of feeding the young, stored in cells till needed, then partly digested with honey, and the kind of child formed of it. When natural pollen cannot be had, the bees will eagerly take farina of rye, chestnuts, or peace. This is not done by the mouth. The feathered hairs with which their bodies are partially clothed, and particularly those of their legs, collect the pollen, which adheres to them and is brushed into a hollow on the outer surface of the first joint of the tarsus of each of the hinder pair of legs. This joint is very large, compressed, and of a square or triangular form, a unique conformation. Drones and queens are destitute of this confirmation, which they do not need. Their senses. These, with the exception of taste, are very delicate. In full daylight, they have the sense of vision in great perfection. A bee lights unerringly on the flowers in search of nectar or pollen, and as an airily finds its own hive. Their hearing is deficient in many directions, but very fine in others, and they seem instantly to understand and obey certain audible signals hardly distinguishable by men. Their smell, too, is acute. They proceed immediately toward honey concealed from their view. Some orders are highly, are highly obnoxious, and that of their stings provokes to immediate rage. They recognize instantly a stranger bee by the sense of smell. Their antennae. But their sense of touch is very fine, and the antennae are of the greatest importance in receiving and conveying impressions. These have many articulations, are very flexible, and can readily embrace the outline of any object, however small the bee wishes to examine. Different naturalists credit these organs with the sense of hearing and of smell, as well as of touch, and it is possible that they are organs of some sense to which we are strangers. But these instruments the bee can execute so many works in the totally dark interior of the hive. By their aid, it builds its combs pours honey into its magazines, feeds the larvae, and ministers to every want which it appears to discover and judge of solely by the sense of touch. They seem also, they seem also the principal means for mutual communication of impressions. The different modes of contact constitute a kind of language susceptible of a great variety of modifications and able to supply every sort of information for which they have occasion. Their extreme sensitiveness. Bees cannot exist in an impure air. The inside of a populous hive scarcely differs in purity from the surrounding atmosphere. Ventilation is kept up by the rapid vibration of the wings of a certain number told off for the purpose, who fasten themselves with their feet to the floor of the hive and imitate the action of flying, so that the force which otherwise would carry them through the air drives back the air in a powerful current. A few occasionally perform this surface 
on the outside of the hive near the entrance, but the larger part are thus engaged inside. Sometimes 20 are thus occupied at once, and the work is done by relays. The motion of their wings is so rapid that they cannot be seen except at the extremities of the arc of vibration, which is at least 90 degrees. Their perceptions of heat and cold are very delicate. A temperature of 40 degrees Fahrenheit will so benumb a bee that it cannot fly and it will soon perish unless restored to a warmer atmosphere. But in a hive, when the extreme external temperature is at 20 degrees below zero, the bees may be found in a solid lump of ice. Yet, when returning spring, they awake to a renewed life and activity. They live the winter though through in many cold parts of Russia in hollow trees with no attention. Many bees, which are thought to die of cold in winter, really die of famine or damp. They show by their conduct that they are sensible of changes in the weather before we are. Huber supposes that in the rapid diminution of light that warms them. Swarming Preparations. The spring is the commencement of the swarming season in which the parent hive sends out new colonies. No swarming takes place while the weather is cold or until the hive is well stocked with eggs. The queen bee, in consequence of the great number of eggs she has been laying, is now reduced to a more slender shape and is well fitted for flight. Her aversion for royal blood and the vain attempts she makes to destroy them in their cradle, in which attempts she is constantly repelled by the guardian bees, produce in her a restlessness and agitation rising to delirium. This is communicated to the workers, and they hurry to and fro in the combs with evident marks of impatience. The heat of the hive increases, and a general buzz is heard. While this state of things continues, preparations are making for the approaching expedition, and provisions are collected in greater quantity by the workers. The swarm departs. On, on the day on which the swarm goes off, a few workers roam far, but several of them are seen performing circles in the air. On, on a sudden, the noise is hushed, and all the bees enter the hive. This silence announces their immediate departure. A few workers appear at the door, turn toward the hive, and striking with their wings, give, as if, as if it were, the signal for flight. All those who are to emigrate rush toward the door, and issue forth their wonderful rapidity, rising in the air and hovering as if to wait for the assemblage of the whole troop. Then, having selected a rallying point, generally on some tree or bush, they alight and are joined by others till all are collected in one mass. If the queen is not with the cluster, the bees will soon find it out and disperse to search for her. Unless she is with them, all go back and the exhibition expedition is deferred until the next fine day. If the queen is lost, they have to remain a fortnight or so and take the next queen, in which case the swarm is larger than the first. After a rest on the landing place just mentioned and finding their queen with them, the mass soars again in the air and makes swiftly to the spot their guides had selected their wings creating a loud and acute tongued hum. Succession of Swarms The parent hive, thus deserted by its queen and so many workers, goes busily to work at repairing its loss. The bees quietly pursue their labors, the young brood, quickly maturing, fill up every deficiency, and young queens 
allowed their liberty, in turn conduct off new swarms. One man reports that he had 22 swarms in one year from a stock of bees which he carried home in his hat from the woods to his garden. But as a general thing, one swarm in a year is enough, and when modern hives are used, further swarming may be prevented by destroying all the queen cells but one after the issue of the first swarm. Honey Honey, honey undergoes slight modifications and chemical changes in the bee's honey bag, which retains the flavor and aroma of the flower from which it is extracted. Thus, it will be seen that the plants and aromatic flowers of certain districts will produce honey, which will be highly prized, and the plants and flowers of other districts will produce unwholesome honey from their noxious or poisonous nature. Honey contains a little wax, pollen, extractive matter, mucilage, gum, manna, grape sugar, acid, and the odor of flowers. When first drawn from the comb, it is quite fluid, but in time it will candy, as it is called, the glucose separating from, sol from the solid parts. The glucose is identical with grape sugar. However, the solid and fluid parts do not greatly differ. With age, honey crystallizes and becomes yellow. The unadulterations of honey are many and varied. That from a corn sugar or glucose is the most common and difficult of detection. You may detect chalk, starch, and other solids by heating the honey, as the, the deleterious matter will settle to the bottom. Pure comb, capped by the bees, commands a much higher price than strained honey, as of the late years, the filling of old combs with glucose has been so largely practiced. Their sting this very remarkable organ consists of two long darts with a protecting sheath. A venom bag is connected with it and powerful muscles for its propulsion. The wound appears to be first made by the sheath along which the poison passes by, by a groove and the darts thrust out afterwards in succession deepen the wound. The darts are each furnished with a number of barbs, which render it so difficult to withdraw them quickly that bees often lose their lives by the injury which they sustain in the effort. The drones are destitute of sting. The poison is said to owe its mischievous effic efficacy to certain pungent salts. If a bee is provoked to strike its sting against a glass top, a drop of poison will be discharged, and if this is placed under a microscope, the salts may be seen to come to concrete as the liquid dries into clear oblong pointed crystals. Number and weight. Hunter counted 2,160 drowned bees in an alehouse pint so that a swarm of two quarts will number about 9,000. Reanumer found that a collection weighing one ounce consisted of 336 bees and therefore a pound would consist of 5,376 bees. A hive is made up of all the way from 5,000 to 60,000 units. In a well-proportioned hive containing, two, two, containing 20,000 bees, there will be one queen, about 500 drones, and the remaining 19,499 workers. The interest of the subject exhaustless. Whenever a student investigates bees, 
whether in their structure or their habits, the farther he goes, the more he finds. Perhaps there is no living creature whose history and life are so curious. As Ag Agassiz wrote volumes on turtles' eggs, so an instructed naturalist might write volumes on almost any single point of the bee's organization and modes of living. The Blind Investigator Perhaps, excuse me, perhaps no one man has contributed so much to the general stock of information as to the constitution and habits of these industrious insects as Francois Huber, born in Geneva in 1750, whose intense application to study brought on total blindness which was never cured. He married a wife who deeply sympathized with and assisted him in his special studies, and by her aid, together with that of his son Pierre and a peasant Bernens, whom he trained to the work of observation, he carried the knowledge of bees many steps forward. Wherever one reads of this interesting subject, his name is continually occurring and his authority is great. Beekeeping and Management Plants Adapted to Bee Pasturage The prevalence of honey-bearing plants must be carefully considered in deciding what number of hives may be profitably kept. Garden flowers are not, as it is often supposed, a prolific source from which bees get honey. Of the clovers, the sweet or red, and the Alsic are eminent for their honey-bearing qualities, while the white clover is valuable only as bee pasturage. The white and Alsic bloom in June and July, but the red clover is useless as bee food until the second growth blossoms, after hay has been made of the first crop. The beekeeper must be governed by the prevalence of bloom in his particular neighborhood in estimating the number of swarms which may find forage during April and May, a very trying time for bees. Corn is the great honey-producing plant all over the West until August and until frost appears, when buckwheat takes its place and during the late, later season, the wildflowers are available. Sumac and white sage are valuable in California, while the cotton plant is a prolific source in the south. In various parts of the country, mustard, wrap, and milkweeds yield honey abundantly. Succession of Pasturages the first trees to produce bloom in the spring are the red and white maples, the aspens and willows. South of 40 degrees, the red bud Judas tree is prolific in its bloom. May gives us alder, sugar maple, haws, crab apple, and nearly all fruit trees and bushes. In May and early June, we have the barberry, grape, white wood, tulip tree, sumac, and during June, the wild plum, raspberry, and blackberry. July gives us basswood, Virginia creeper, and button bush. In the hilly regions of the south, all these trees thrive. Many of them are not found in the west. In California, the pepper tree and red gum are noted for late bloom. When there are plenty of these plants, the beekeeper need fear no lack of bloom, even leaving out of account others not mentioned here. Hives The hive should be closely joined and strongly fastened together. In its construction, study simplicity first. About 4,000 cubic inches should be its contents. If comb honey in frames is desired, 2,000 cubic inches or even less will answer if the surplus honey 
is to be contained in caps. We give a cut showing a hive that anyone who can use carpenter's tools can make or that several parts can be bought ready to put together of any firm dealing in beekeeper's supplies. It is called the Langstroth Hive. Its working parts are easily adjusted. It comes as near as possible to being moth and vermin proof. No hive can be entirely so. Movable Frames We give herewith two illustrations showing different styles of movable frames. The smaller one having but a few cells of comb in it. The larger one completely filled. Six or eight inches square is the size of the smaller, which when filled with comb will hold about a pound of honey. Placed side by side and joined together, a number of them will occupy the same space in a hive as a larger frame. Of course, the more convenient for handling are the small frames. By their use, honey can be sold in small quantities, frame and all, to suit retail buyers. English Straw Hives In Great Britain, where the beekeeper does not wish to closely examine the habits of his bees, the old-fashioned straw hive, so long common as the emblem of industry, still holds its own. In some parts of Europe, cork hives are used, and in Turkey and Greece, they are made of earthenware. Our English friends think that a good straw hive is a better protection to the bees and the honey than one of wood. We give a cut of a hive popular with them. Profitable number of swarms. Don't get too many swarms. When a few swarms are kept, the bees are healthy and give plenty of surplus honey because there's plenty of foliage for them to make it from. When the swarms are increased too largely, the result is, of course, like crops of honey, diseases, and all imaginable pests, and finally starvation. Great care and breeding are artificially may, to be sure, prevent this where the farmer has the time to devote to it. But he seldom has the time. Twenty is the largest number we have been able to keep, and keep profitably and healthily, even on the, on the most prolific of feeding grounds. Indeed, the greatest profit with the least outlay has been from 10 to 12 swarms, and some locations will not support more than half this number. Five or six swarms may be kept on almost any farm range. Swarming It is well for every farmer to have his bees swarm as early in the season as possible. The old saw says, a swarm in May is worth a ton of hay. A swarm in June is worth a silver spoon. A swarm in July is not worth a fly. Always bear this in mind. Early swarms become populous and have plenty of honey before the dry season and heat cut off the supply of food and are able to carry themselves through. Late swarms are weak and finally succumb to the inevitable. Hiving Swarms When you are working around bees, avoid all hasty or quick movements. These provoke stinging. If by any means a bee gets crushed or pinched in your clothing, it will sting you. Otherwise, there is little danger unless you go about the work in an excited manner. In case you are stung, get out of the way quietly and as quickly as possible before the odor of the sting excites the whole swarm. An ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. Protect yourself as much as possible by putting on the hands leather gauntlet gloves and tying them firmly around the wrists, tying the pantaloons tightly around the legs of the boots, 
and wearing thick, loose clothes. A bee veil is an ordinary piece of netting tied or sewn around the rim of the hat and tucked inside the coat collar, etc. If the bees are settled upon a handy bush, simply shake them carefully into the hive, as many as you can, having, of course, got your hive all ready beforehand. Cover the hive and place it near where the other bees may enter. If the larger part of the swarm falls to the ground, drive them to the entrance by gently and carefully sweeping them with something soft. When they begin to enter, leave them to themselves until evening, when they must set where they will are to remain permanently. In case of the swarm settling on a limb so far up that you cannot reach it, tie one end of a rope around the limb and throw the other end up over a higher limb, passing it to an assistant on the ground. Then saw off the limb, easing on the rope, so that the limb will fall gently to the ground, that it will not may not disturb the bees. Put the bees into the hive as, as already directed. You will seldom lose a swarm if you keep your eyes open and hold yourself in readiness when indications of a swarm are apparent. The beating of tin pans and throwing of water and sand around the swarm is useless. But in case of their rising up and seemingly inclined to make off, a good dash of water or sand will often bring them to the ground, doubtless because they think it is a bad day for swarming. Swarm catchers are sometimes used. A bushel basket on a long handle makes a good one. Getting the honey. Wait until you are sure the bees are filled with honey before you try to work about them. Being alarmed in any way, as tapping on the hive or smoking, they will at once fill themselves with honey. Let them get filled. It will not take above five minutes. They will be quiet and will not sting unless hurt. Now remove the honey, paying no attention to the flying bees. If you do, they will sting you. We give a good cut of a popular form of smoker. Very little smoke answers the purpose. A few whiffs from an ordinary tobacco pipe will answer. If the honey sticks, cut it with a thin knife as shown in the cut. Care of bees in winter. A shelter facing southeast and having watertight roof and three sides is the best place for bees all year round, the open front being protected by shutters or otherwise to keep out the snow in winter. The hives should stand about a foot above the ground and sometimes in severe weather be protected with straw or corn stalks. Bees, as before stated, endure extreme cold when healthy and with plenty of food. Wet and snow among them are fatal. Feeding bees. A multitude of appliances have been invented for this purpose, but the old simple way is as good as any. Take a common wide mouth pickle bottle, fill it with syrup, and tie over a double fold of net, or invert the bottle on a piece of perforated sink over the feeding hole of the hive. The supply can be regulated by the number and size of the holes. In cold weather, instead of syrup, use barley sugar made by boiling for 10 minutes two pounds of loaf sugar in a pint of water, adding a little vinegar to prevent crystallization. It is a poor economy to stint the bees in food. In the early spring, slow and continu continuous feeding will stimulate the queen to oviposit, by which means the stalks are rapidly strengthened and throw off early swarms. It is a singular fact that if stimulating feeding has been for some time pursued and the supply be cut off and nothing coming in from the fields, 
the bees will destroy all the young larvae and eggs. Instinct, instinct seeming to teach the wise insects that the resources of the colony will be insufficient to feed the young. Water. An abundant supply of water is essential to the health of bees. They consume a large quantity and often stop to drink at the edge of stagnant pools and seem even to prefer putrid and urinous waters to purer streams, as if their saline and pungent qualities were grateful to them. Robber Bees With all their intelligence, bees are sometimes oblivious of the claims of Mium and Loom. When a hive is too weak, or perhaps attracted by the odor of a broken comb or food placed near the hive, sometimes other bees will attack and rob it. Take the hive thus menace, menaced to a cellar or other cool dark place and keep there a couple of days. Putting a similar hive in its place on the bottom of which rub warm wood. Sometimes marking the entrance of a hive Making the entrance of a hive so small that only one bee can enter and leave at once will break up the robbery, and sometimes breaking the comb in their own hive will make the robbers give up their designs. Their enemies. Of these, the bee moths are the worst. They penetrate the hives, lay their eggs which hatch into cocoons and caterpillars, and live in the honey eating it and filling the comb with webs, meanwhile protecting themselves in a sort of silken sack which they spin. The hives should be examined daily from May 1st until late in the fall. In the evening they hover about and try to enter the hives. Shallow dishes holding sweetened water and a little vinegar placed near the hives will catch many of them, and hollow sticks and little shells are often placed on the bottom board to receive their eggs. Rats, mice, and spiders will sometimes attack bees. Foul brood. A disease with this name is very destructive to bees in their larvae condition. They die in their cells and become putrid. The disease is infectious. Drive out the bees into a clean, new hive. It is custom in some locations of Europe to put and keep them a day in a temporary hive before placing them in the new one where they are able to live. For foreign honey fed to bees should be previously scalded. Profits. Great stories are told of the profits sometimes derived from beekeeping 130 hives are reported to have made 1,800 profit in a season, and 90 others $900. A single colony is reported to have given a profit of $35 in a season. A province in Holland is said to have an average of 2,000 hives to the square mile. It is estimated that in 1865, there were in Attica, Greece, an area of 45 square miles to 20,000 hives. Italian bees. The Italian or Ligurian bee, heretofore referred to, it is said to be a much more profitable bee to keep than the common black bee. Langstroth reports his Italian bees as gathering twice as much honey as the common bees. Quimby says he has not had a single unfavorable report from them. They thrive in high latitudes and are particularly adapted to the climate of Oregon and Washington and the mountains of California. Thus concludes my reading of the chapter of bees from the standard horse and stock book and the Farmer's Practical Guide, published in 1902. I thank you for listening, and I hope you enjoyed it.
I hope you will listen again in a future video.